Was it God that forgive, convinced you not to get uh, forgiven? What spirit is telling you that you don't have to spend the rest of this day begging God to forgive you? Is that God? Is it the devil? Why are you okay ending this stream, clicking off of here, going on with your normal life? What spirit allows you to do that when God is calling for you? He's recklessly running and chasing after you, doing everything that he can to get your attention. He's practically begging you, please, I've done everything. I've given my whole life. I've given every drop of my blood. The Bible says water came out after the blood. That means there's no more blood left. He gave all he got. He gave everything he got. And all you have to do is just accept it. Luke 11, 13, read with me. <clears throat> if ye then being evil, sinful by nature, you are sinful by nature. Know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, to them that ask him? Before I received the Holy Ghost, I heard a couple people say, a few people say it in my lifetime, it was the easiest thing they have ever done. And it made no sense to me, none, none whatsoever. I remember being on the altar all night. I'm talking all night, two, three o'clock in the morning. There was a few times I was on the altar praising God till the sun came up. I remember in high school fasting for days. I missed out on so much while I was in high school, reading my Bible and asking God for this gift that he said he really wants me to have. My natural father, my natural father didn't have a single thing. He didn't have anything that he wouldn't share with me. God said, I want to give you my spirit more than you want to give good gifts to your kids. So I'm wondering, why don't God just do it? For anyone seeking the power of the Holy Ghost, for anyone seeking the power of the Holy Ghost, the first thing you got to do, the first thing you have to do is ask. God already made it clear that he wants you to have his spirit just as much as your natural father would want to give you a good gift. Jesus said, ask, A, and it shall be given. Seek. S, and you will find. Knock, K, and it will be open. See how God did that? The acronym for ask is ask. Ask, ask, seek, knock. That's what he said. Ask, seek, and knock. Ask. There is nothing in this world, there's nothing more precious than a ticket away from the impending destruction, the escape of the lake of fire. Nothing is more valuable than a gift that will allow you to be in the right standing of God. Even now, today. Today, if the Lord delays his coming, today, the Holy Ghost is still the greatest gift you can ask. The Holy Ghost is a comforter through hard times. The, the, the Holy Ghost is the ability. It, it literally means that you have the ability to walk around with the presence of the, the almighty God in your body. It, the Holy Ghost is a direct connection to the Creator and a very present help in the time of trouble. All of this, you get all of this, it starts with asking, then seeking, and finally knocking. We all know the story of King David. Just talk to you about it in a second. We all know how far he went. He went as far as murder. I want to focus on Psalms 51, where it records these words. In the first verse, it says to the chief musician, a Psalm of David, when Nathan, the prophet, came in, came unto him after he had gone in unto Bathsheba. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercy, blot out my transgression. For those of you that don't know King David, let me tell you about King David. He was a warrior. He was a powerful man. He fought lions and bears. And as a child, when he was a kid, he killed Goliath. He killed a giant and his brother, chopped his head clean off. He went to war and he left nothing. He leveled cities, he killed thousands. He even defeated Amalek when Saul failed. They wrote a song. They wrote a song about his sin. It's amazing how people forget all the good he did and only remember. Can you imagine? You killed a giant with a rubber band and a rock and they write a song about your sin? They sang songs 
after you messed up about your mistake. All the good that David has done, all the enemies that he wiped out, here we have on record a memory of his sin. It is here in the very first verse of Psalm 51 that we see David crying out to God. He started off in pain. That's weird. He didn't address God. He, he didn't praise God first. He asked for mercy first. Why? Because mercy is paramount and it's not guaranteed. Mercy is not guaranteed. God don't owe you nothing. There are no things that God owes you. God doesn't owe you anything. You the one that sinned. David paid dearly for his sin, right? He paid for it. But there's a song. There's a song. There's a book in the Bible that, that's been read by millions of people. It's a shame. Even after you're dead, people are still singing about your sin. It didn't go away. If David asked God to blot out his transgression, what is transgression? Transgression is breaking the commandment. Remember the first clause that we just read? He said transgression. That's plural. Why isn't he focusing on the one sin that he committed? And why does it matter? It says blot out his transgression. Blot it out of what? What happens if God doesn't blot out his transgression? What happens if the sins he commit remains on record? Luke eleven thirteen 13 says, how much more shall your heavenly father give you the Holy Ghost or give the Holy Ghost or give the Holy Spirit, same thing, to them that A-S-K him? Before you A, ask, you have to A, acknowledge. Acknowledge you messed up. I want everybody to stand. Name some things that you've done that you don't want anybody to know about. What is that one thing that you want God to keep us? Think he didn't see it? Think he didn't record it? Are you hoping he just forgot about it? Acknowledge you messed up. Don't try to justify it. Resist the temptation to come up with an excuse. Just say, I acknowledge my sin. Simple. That's what David said. David said, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. How was your sin ever before you? Before you? When you stand before the Lord, your sins will be there before you get there. Verse 4, David says, God, when you judge me, I want it to be clear. I want, I want it to be clear that you justify because I admit it. Against you and only you have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. And, and God, you're going to be justified when you speak. And, you're going to, and, and be clear when you judge. Wait. So your sins was in God's sight? He said he done this evil in his sight. God is his own eyewitness against you. God don't need nobody to tell him what you did. He saw you. He even tried to help you avoid it. But you did it anyway. That's why when he judges you, that's why when he judges me, that's why when he judges us, he will be justified because he's seen you do it. He's your, his own eyewitness. The devil didn't make you do nothing. Nobody made you do nothing. Nobody made you do anything. You chose to sin and you enjoyed how it felt. You enjoyed what you stole. You liked how that lie sound as it passed through your lips. Sin is designed to feel good. Otherwise, how would it ever be enticing? And that's the point of sin, be enticing enough to draw you away from God. In verse 6, Psalm 51, David said, Behold, your de you desire truth in your inward part. God said, I want you to be honest. I messed up. Me, Brother Scholar, I messed up. I made a bunch of mistakes in my life. I sinned more time than I want you to know. How many lies have God recorded since my birthday? Since I was born, how many how many things have I done and God got them all recorded? How about you? What about you? How many lies have you told? How many things have how many half truths have you told? Or you just embellished just a little bit? How many secrets you got? Secret sins. The scripture talks about a hidden part. What's the hidden part? 
What's the inward part? I acknowledge I'm a big mess. I acknowledge that and I acknowledge I need help. In verse 13, it says, then David said, I'm going to teach transgressors their thy ways. This is what David decided he's going to do. You see that? David figured out something. He's not just saying he's sorry. He's not re just repenting. He has something to offer God. He's going to give God something. I'm going to teach other sinners about their ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. David said, I'm going to be so far away from sin. I'm going to teach people. Don't ever do what I did. Because sin would get you sent to the lake of fire. How is David so confident that his testimony, his teaching, how is he so confident that it's going to convert people? Are you converted? How are you going to convert somebody unless you've fully done with this stuff? Most people straddle the fence. You want to know how much sin can I get away with? What's wrong with this? What's wrong with that? I heard a preacher say, if, if God said don't wear purple, he wouldn't wear blue because it takes blue to make purple. Now think about that. That's a commitment that somebody made. Compare that with somebody else that says, what's wrong with purple? Or God don't care what I wear. What about violet? That's not purple, right? Psalms 19 and 7 says, the law of the Lord is, read it with me. The law of the Lord is what? Perfect. The commandments are perfect. They lack nothing. It says the covenant of the Lord doesn't change. It makes a smart man stupid, but I'm going to obey it. You don't get to determine what God will accept. He will accept none less, nothing less than your total surrender. In Psalm 51 verse 17, the sacrifices, I want you to remember that word, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. Oh God, thou will not despise. It's crying time. What's a broken spirit? When has your heart ever been broken? That boy you liked that didn't like you? That girl that broke up with you? How come your heart not broken now? You messed up. The devil didn't make you do nothing. You enjoyed sinning, didn't you? While you were enjoying sinning, while you were enjoying the pleasures of sin, at the same exact time, you were breaking your God's heart. I broke God's heart. I admit it. What about you? Every slide matters. I broke God's heart and I admit it. Can you admit that you broke God's heart? Matthew 19 and 16, one day this old dude came and said to Jesus, he said, hey, 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 good master. What good thing, singular, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? Okay. <clears throat> Next verse, he said unto him, why are you calling me good? There's none good but one is God. Do you know what I am? Do you really know who you're talking to? But if you want to enter into eternal life, keep the commandments. Why isn't God telling this young man that all you got to do is believe? He obviously believes he called him good. He obviously believes he called him master. He obviously believes he came asking him how to get eternal life. Don't worry, Jesus don't know how to get eternal life, right? That's above his pay grade. That's the wrong person to ask, right? This man, like some of us, can't handle the truth. He can't handle God telling him what he has to give up. You the one that asked, what do I have to do to go to heaven? You don't get to pick. You don't get to choose. This ain't your heaven. You ain't entitled to nothing. God said in Matthew 19, 29, and everybody that has forsaken their house might have to move. And everybody that has forsaken their brethren you might have to stop hanging with some of your homies, sister. You may have to give up some family members. In some cases, you might have to give up your parents. You might have to give up your wife. You might have to give up your kids, your job. It is here that God is making your promise. Listen to this promise. He said, everybody that gives up these things for my name's sake, you're going to get a hundredfold. You're going to get a hundred times more. And shall, and shall. And you will inherit eternal life. It's a promise from God. It's okay to give up whatever you're holding on to. Here comes yet another guy in Mark. Same question. I want you to picture this dude on his knees asking, how do I get to heaven? How do I live forever? Jesus' response is simple. 
said, you know the commandment. Do not commit adultery. Do not kill. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor thy father and your mother. Why, why is Jesus still talking about them Old Testament commandments? Why is that his response? The guy said, yeah, 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 I know, I know the commandments. I, I've been keeping them since I was a kid. Why does this guy have a testimony of keeping the commandment? Should you? Should I? Verse 21 says, then Jesus looking at him, loved him. Isn't that enough? That God loved him? If you believe in Jesus and Jesus loves you, what else should I look to do? Then Jesus said unto him, one thing thou lackest. One thing you're coming up short with. Go. Go away. Sell what you got. Give it to the poor. And then you'll have treasure in heaven. And then come take up the cross and follow me. God help me today. It is here right now in this verse that God creates a tailor-made solution for man's lifelong desire to live forever. Right? Who wants to die? Who doesn't have heaven as their goal? Heaven your goal? Jesus loved him. And that wasn't enough? He lacked something. I thought salvation was based on what the Lord is supposed to do. Why, why is there any requirement? Why is there any behavior on, based on my action? Why do I have to do something? Why is there something I have to seek? Acts 5.31 says, Him hath God exalted, Jesus, with his right hand to be a prince, prince of peace, Jesus, and a savior, Jesus. For what purpose? To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sin. Why does it say repentance and forgiveness of sin? Why does it say that separately? Isn't repentance forgiveness? Did you obtain forgiveness when you repented? Did you obtain forgiveness when you stopped sinning? What is repentance? The meaning of repentance is a change of mind. More specifically, a change of your inner man, a change of your soul's desire to change the stuff that your soul wants. Notice the definition of repentance does not say forgiveness. It's not in there. It doesn't say stop doing anything. It says change of mind. That's why David said, I'm sorry. Sorry. I'm telling you, God, I'm done with sin, done with it. And everybody is going to know it. Everybody who sees me will know. I'm going to live a life so that every person will know that I'm done with sin. You know what it means that everybody will know you're done with sin? David said, I'm going to tell people about sin. Because people need to know it separates you from God. Sin clouds your judgment. Sin hurts people. It brings consequences. The, the wages of sin is still death. That's who you have to deal with, death. Sin forces you and introduces you to death, which separates you from God. I wish you could just sin. Don't you? I wish you could just sin and then pay a fine or even go to jail. And then that's all you need to get your record expunged. Proverbs, I'm sorry, Proverbs 15. It says the eyes of the Lord are in every place. That thing you stole, that lie you told, that girl you fornicated with. You can't get the Holy Ghost unless you deal with sin, your sin. You got to deal with that time you got drunk. That nasty stuff you watched on your phone. You got to get purged that out of you. That driver you gave the finger to. Your potty mouth. That time you got lifted up in pride. That day you were disobedient as a child. The eyes of the Lord is in every place. It's all been recorded. What you going to do? What you going to do? How are you going to get your record clear with God? You need an answer. What you going to do? You do. That's why God tells preachers, don't be afraid of their faces. Why? That's why God says, cry loud and don't hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. God said, show my people their sins. Show it to them. If you're sitting in a church, listen to me very carefully, YouTube. If you're sitting in a church and the pastor won't tell you about your sins, run for your life. If a man of God loves you, he'll tell you. He'll tell you straight to your face. You got to live holy. He'll warn you what's going to happen on judgment day. I don't care about your tithes. I don't care about your offering. I want to see your soul saved. The eyes of the Lord is in every place. Every one of our sins have been recorded. What are you going to do? How are you going to get your record clear with God? 
What's your plan? What does God want? Verse 16, David said, Lord, I know you don't desire an animal sacrifice. If you did, I would get one in a second. I, I know, Lord, a burnt offering won't make you happy. So if I can't kill a lamb, if God don't want an animal on the altar, what does he want? He wants you. He wants you on the altar. He wants you to kill that sinful nature that you got, those proclivities that you had since you were born, those ungodly desires that comes from the inside. What's inside of you? Why do you desire things that's against the word of God? He wants you to reverse your decision. Psalm 38, 17 says, For I am ready to stop with halt. I'm ready to stop. I'm done. And my sorrow is continually before me. He said, I won't do that no more. But what power is it in just stopping to do something? If you got arrested for stealing, and you repent from stealing, did you get forgiveness, forgiveness for stealing? What if you still have the thing you stole and you're still enjoying it? If you stop backbiting and lying, did you get forgiven just because you stopped? What about the carnage of the lives you ruined, destroyed with your mouth? David said, I would declare my iniquity. He said, I'm going to admit it. You see how many times I'm saying? I'm going to admit it. I will be sorry. I will be sorry for my sin. That's why the scripture says, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. But the sorrow of the world worketh death. There's a different type of sorrow. Godly sorrow worketh repentance. You gotta work for the gift of repentance. You gotta be sorry to God. Godly sorrow. That ain't the same sorry that you say when you get, you're about to get kicked out of school. Godly sorrow. That ain't the same sorrow you tell the judge so you don't go to jail. Godly sorrow. That's the sorrow you have when God shows you that, that that lie that you told is enough to send you to the lake of fire. Because the Bible does say all liars will what? Have their part in the lake of fire. You mean to tell me a little old lie is enough? I'm just reading the Bible. I'm just telling you the Bible. What am I going to do? I told a whole bunch of lies. That's why I need to tell God, I'm sorry. I'm going to ask you again. What are you going to do to get God to forgive you? You got a report from the doctor. that You got sclerosis of the liver because you're occasional drinking. You know, that, that every now and then drinking that you thought was no big deal. Okay? And you repent. You stop drinking. Did you automatically get forgiveness for destroying your body or destroying the lives of people? By your behavior while you were under the influence of these spirits you consumed? Did you get forgiveness simply because you stopped? If you go upside your wife's head and decide, I won't do it no more. Did your wife automatically forgive you just because you stopped? Did God forgive you? If this guy right here, if he knocked his wife's teeth out and then he called you and said, man... She's still mad at me, even though I stopped hitting her. I'll never do it again. What advice would you have for him for this piece of garbage? What do you think he would have to do for his wife to forgive him? Do you really think saying, I'm sorry, is enough? Acts 5.32, and we are his witnesses of these things. And so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God has given to them that obey him. Wait, catch that? Who does God give the Holy Ghost to? God gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. God gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. God gives the Holy Ghost to them that obey him. How do you obey God? The Bible says in 2 Ezra 9, 11, And they that have loathed my law, God said, they hated it. My law. That's what loathed means. While they had the freedom to choose, and you had the free will, right now, today, to make a choice, and when repentance was open unto them, that's for those uh, that think they can get saved later. When they get older, I'll get saved tomorrow. When I'm done doing all the stuff I want to do. The Bible says when a place of repentance was open unto them. Thought you can come to a sovereign God whenever you feel like it. Today is the space of time that God has allotted for your life. Look at your life as a timeline. This is the day you're born. This is the day calls you home. The day God calls you home. Okay. 
There's a space of time in there that God is going to allow your repentance. Is that today? What do you do if you miss that space of time that God has allowed for that? If you decide, I'm going to get saved when I feel like it. I'm going to get saved over here. Later. It's always later on, isn't it? It's never, I'm going to get saved right now. It's always later on. The Bible said, and you didn't, you didn't understand it. You didn't understand that you only had a space of time. You thought you had time. The Bible says, but you despised it. That's what it says right here. It, it, you said, it don't take all that. What's wrong with this? Where it say that? Where it say I can't do that? Instead of saying, Lord, I want to please you. Show me how to make you happy. I want to give you, God, I want to give you what you want. Let's go back to Mark 10. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him and said unto him, one thing thou lackest. Notice it said Jesus beholding him. So here we have Jesus looking right at him. Listen, being in the presence of the Lord ain't enough. Going to church ain't enough. Jesus beholding him, loved him. Even if God loves you, it still ain't enough. This shows the power that the thing that you lack has. Along with your free will, it can overpower God's love. He said, go your way. God's instruction, weird. Why did he say go your way? Why does he have to leave his presence? Why does he get sent away? Why is the next step for salvation not included with this current position? Lord, why can't I just get saved in your presence? That's because God wants you to come to him when you're ready to pour out. Pour yourself out. Give yourself up. Don't come with your isms and your schisms. Don't come with your proud spirit. You want God to save you and you still got stuff you want to hold on to. Go away. Come back when you're ready. You know the problem with that? You know what the problem with that is? The problem with that is God never stays in the same place. That's why in Hebrews he says, today if you hear my voice. Who said it? What does it say? The Holy Ghost said it. The Holy Ghost said, if you hear his voice, because the Holy Ghost has a voice. And trust me, when he steps inside of you, everybody going to hear that voice. If it was me, standing in the presence of God Almighty, and he said, go, I would have said no. I like that. If God said go, you say no. He should have said, forget all that stuff. He should have said, forget all that stuff that he has and, and follow God. I would have said, go my way. You are the way. Can I just come with you? It, if you miss the chance to get saved, if you miss the move of God in your life, if you leave his presence, how are you so sure you'll get another chance? Who promised you that you'll get another chance? He said, get rid of your stuff. That stuff you love the most and give it away. Would you give away your phone? Your bank account? Your car? God? God wants you to love him more than you love anything. If, if you can't do that, go away. Because you're not ready to be saved. You can't have your current life and then just add God to it. You want this life while God is offering eternal life? Why would you want this life, your current life, and God is offering eternal life? It's not the same life. It's a different life. One thing you lack. One problem you got. What is it? What is the one thing that you have a hard time giving up? Get that on your mind. What is that one thing you don't want to separate from? Be honest. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin. Did you catch that? Not just the sin. There's some stuff you got to let go that's not necessarily sin. The gift of the Holy Ghost ain't cheap. Heaven ain't cheap. Seeing God's face in peace will all be worth it. Hearing him say, well done, is better than hearing him say, it's too late. Hearing him say, well done, it's better than hearing him say, I gave you a space of time. Verse 1 says, which so easily sets us back. What sets us back? Sin? Nope. Because you can't even get started with sin. So how can sin get set you back? It's those weights that set you back. It's an app on your phone. It's being lukewarm. 
It's your own mind that won't surrender. That's what's setting you back. What is that thing you lack? Which one of y'all got something you holding on to? This guy the Lord was talking to was rich. He had a lot of precious stuff. Nice house, pool. Is that a sin? No. Nice car. Season pass. Front row seats. Is that a sin? Nope. He had status. The status comes along with money. Right? He had lots of friends. Because when you have money, people flock. Money is attractive. You see, it's more than him just being rich. He knew people that can get him into places. VIP section. That a sin? Nope. You earned it. You got your degree. You worked hard. You worked your way up. Good. If none of that is a sin, what's the problem? First, it's your pride. That's the first thing. You got to kill it. The number one reason people don't get the Holy Ghost is because of pride. It's dying time. It's time to kill your desires. It's time to kill your pride. You would have had the Holy Ghost by now if you weren't worried about how you look. You got to give God the sacrifice. Remember I said, remember that word sacrifice. It's a sacrifice of praise that you got to give to God. And the only way you're going to live, the only way you'll have eternal life is if you give up your current life. Paul said, kill the deeds, kill the stuff. Destroy the desires of your flesh. You got to want God more than you want anything else. You got to want God more than you have than any of your worldly possessions. You're going to leave it here anyway. How many times have you seen a U-Haul truck going behind a hearse? When you're getting buried, there is no U-Haul truck carrying your stuff. You're going by yourself. You're not carrying anything. Why are you worried about this stuff? I asked you earlier, what does God require? He doesn't want a dead animal. What does he want? He wants you, but he wants all of you. Say this with me. God wants to be God of all, or he doesn't want to be God else. He wants praise, total praise, all your praise. He wants praise from every fiber of your being. He wants you to not be ashamed of him. We read Psalms 51, 15, and we see that David's heart is broken. He realized that he hurt God. He hurt his own God. He said, oh Lord, open my lips. Why is he telling God to open his lips? Because he's talking from his spirit and he's hurt and his heart is broken and he's moaning. He said, oh God, open my lips and watch what happens. My mouth is going to praise you. My mouth shall show forth your praise. David ain't worried about how he look. His soul is in trouble. How can y'all sit there so when your final destination ain't heaven. What's your wonderful plan when the Lord returns? Let me hear it. Let's hear your game plan. What excuses are you going to give when your sins precede you and they're waiting for you in a book? Today is the day to get them blotted out. Today is the day to say, Lord, I'm sorry. Y'all should be doing that already. Today you hear his voice. Don't make your heart hard. Get down on your knees and tell God, I'm sorry. Stop trying to get the Holy Ghost and get forgiveness. How are you going to get the Holy Ghost and you haven't been forgiven yet? God would, will, will not dwell in an unclean vessel. He's not going to do it. He said, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, here in Romans 8, 9, he said, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you are not his. Did you read that? It's on the screen. I, I copied and pasted this from the Bible. He said, if you don't have the Holy Ghost, you're not his. It's not okay to be walking around before Judgment Day without the Holy Ghost. I'm working on a lesson called One Hour Before the Lord Returns. What will you be doing? How do you know when he's coming back? How, do you, how are you so sure how much time you have? What is that thing that got you in a place where, you, where you're not afraid of the lake of fire? How, did you, how are you so callous that you're not worried that God is going to come back and judge you based on your actions? What is that thing that you have that you're holding on to that doesn't allow you to be afraid of the lake of fire? Was it God that convinced you not to get forgiveness? What spirit is telling you that you don't have to spend the rest of this day begging God to forgive you? Is that God? Is it the devil? Why are you okay ending this stream, clicking off of here, going on with your normal life? What spirit allows you to do that when God is 
calling for you. He's recklessly running and chasing after you and doing everything that he can to get your attention. He's practically begging you, please, I've done everything. I've given my whole life. I've given every drop of my blood. The Bible says water came out after the blood. That means there's no more blood left. He gave all he got. He gave everything he got. And all you have to do is just accept it. Just accept his gift of repentance. But you want this life. You think you got time. God is not giving you the spirit that lets you think that you don't have to get forgiveness. Was it God that told you, you got plenty of time. I'm taking my sweet time. I'm not coming back anytime now. Did God tell you that? Who's making you think that? The river you're afraid is already dried up. You know what happens after that? If you read Revelation, that's number six. You know what happens number seven? God comes. That's what the Bible says. Come on, y'all. You can do this. You can get your soul saved. You can get God's attention. It's time to cry out and say, Lord, help me. That's what David did. David realized I messed up and you don't see him. You don't see him messing up no more. He got it right. He said, God, I'm sorry. That's all you got to do. It's time to make a commitment with God and promise him you'll obey every word in this book. You can do it. You can do it. You can do it. God is right here right now waiting on you to talk to him. But he wants to hear your heart, not your mouth. He wants to hear your heart. You got to convince him that you're sorry. How are you going to convince him you're sorry? What's your plan? You don't have the Holy Ghost. God comes back. What's your plan? You're going to talk your way out of it? What's in this world that you want? Why let the devil trick you into thinking you got time? What is it that you love more than God? Answer me. How can you be so peaceful when your soul is in trouble? This doesn't end well for you unless you surrender. Turn away from sin. Cry out to God. All the good that David did can't outweigh his sin. His sin was recorded, but he got it right. He cried out to God and said, Lord, I'm sorry. Take this thing that's inside of me that causes me to desire unrighteousness. Take it away, God. Replace my spirit with yours, Lord. Give me something better inside of me. Oh, God, help me, please. I hope, I hope you really got a good plan. Because Romans 8 and 9 says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, if any person does not have the Holy Ghost, he is none of his. So how can you be saved without the Holy Ghost? He said you're none of his. You have to get forgiven. It's not optional. You have to get forgiven. Somebody should be saying, thank you, Jesus. Somebody about to holler, Lord, save me. But if you're worried, you're in your house right now, wherever you're sitting, it's not hard. You're in your own house. You're around your own people. Why is it so difficult for you to say, God, you can scream and laugh and watch a movie and do whatever you got to do. And you'll make as much noise as you could. But if I said, open your mouth and say, Lord, save me. That's the hardest thing for you to do. Why? Who's stopping you? What's grasping your mouth? What's holding your tongue? Who's telling you that? That you can't say anything? This is the time to give God a praise. This is, a, this is the time to get his attention. Can't get that going? Hmm? Doesn't work? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate you. God is good. If you have any questions, if you want me to pray for you, need prayer, today is the greatest day. Today is the day to give God some praise. This is the day. Today, this is the day. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. If there's anybody that has a prayer request, if you're seeking God, if you're not seeking God's presence, if you think you have all the time in the world, let, let's talk about it. Get in touch with me. Let's talk about it.